Football Podcast. Touchdown Ram! Recovered by the Chargers. Touchdown UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's up, Los Angeles? Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the LA Football Podcast on the LA Football Network. We are also on the Believe Podcast Network. Everywhere you listen to podcasts, we are. I'm your co-host, Ryan Dyer, joined, as always, by the great Frosty Rucker. What's up, Frost? How you doing, man? Ryan, I'm great. LA, I'm fantastic. Glad to join you today. Yeah, we got a great show, but but first, what's what's new with you? Anything new and exciting or same old, yeah, same old, just grinding away? I'm just growing, chopping wood, trying to, you know, stay mentally fresh. Um, you know, a lot of things are being lifted with the more vaccinations that are coming out, and that means more sports for the youth, and that's right up our alley with our Stay Ready program. So uh, just staying busy with that, building something great, and, you know, trying to get the the, the special interviews to come on our show like we got today. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, we talk a little bit more later too, but stay ready football.com. If you guys are interested in, um, you know, youth clinics and, and growing and, and continue to grind, look that up, stay ready football.com. But we have a fantastic interview today for all those Rams fans out there, really just for football fans, but uh, specifically Rams fans right now, Andrew Whitworth, great left tackle played with frosty in Cincinnati. So the, the lines, the, the relationship goes way back, but we get him to, to bless us on the show today. And we talk some Rams football, talk about his journey, talk a little bit of everything. So uh, thank you Frost, for uh, the connection there. And uh, yeah, this is, this is a good one. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you know, you LA fans that follow the Rams and you follow big wit, you know, where his heart is, you know, how hard he works, you know, how uh, top of the game he is on the field and off. This is just another chance for you guys to really dig deep and know who he is and he's a phenomenal guy and there's no wonder why you guys adore him so much so let's go ahead and bring big andrew in yeah absolutely so right before we get into that couple sponsors to mention about on the show obviously betonline.ag you guys know them well if you listen to the la football podcast the greatest uh lines uh spreads parlays anything you need betonline.ag head there on mobile or on desktop you get 50 percent welcome bonus so that's they add 50 percent of whatever you deposit they add 50 percent to that that's free money um if you haven't signed up there head to betonline.ag the masters wrapped up uh did you, you watch the masters all frost are you a, i know you golf but are you a golf fan or, or not really into into watching it i, I watched the highlights i'm good at watching highlights <laughs> there you go uh, I just- I just love yeah, the voice of Jim Nance and the Azaleas and yeah. Oh yeah. And then the, the masters is such a special event, but you know, I was kind of boycotting off all things Atlanta just because of what's going on with the voter stuff. So I, I, I sat that one out, but I can say I did watch the highlights and uh, the young man that won uh, coming from a, a very far land and, you know, not a lot of people can travel here and he didn't have much support and he, he pulled it out. So uh, kudos to him. Yeah. Hideki Matsuyama with the win. So Huge congratulations to him. His first major had a lot of close finishes, but um, all that being said, betonline.ag is your place to wager. Um, NBA's ramping up. Lakers had a big win over the Brooklyn Nets, potential NBA finals championship, and they didn't have any of their big three and and still knocked them out of the park. So I know that was a lot of talk in LA here. So um, betonline.ag, that's your place to go. So win some money. I was pretty pumped on that. And I think AD and maybe Braun will be shortly following, but AD is going to be back. So uh, I'm pretty pumped on that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they looked good. And and hey, my Nuggets are still still rolling too. I think the Western Conference Championship is going to be, it should be Nuggets Lakers, I think. Yeah, it should be the same as, you know, the COVID series, but, um, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same outcome too. We'll see. We'll see. Well, the big thing, so we got Aaron Gordon, obviously we talked about that. That was a big trade, but then Jamal Murray last night just got injured. I don't know how serious that is. That could be a huge development. Yeah, that could, that can completely shift everything. Completely. They could, they'll still make the playoffs, but that could knock them down big. So, um, but anyway, last thing before we get into Andrew Whitworth, got to talk about uh Sunday scaries. Are you a, uh, you a CBD guy at all? Frosty help you relax at all. Yeah, I am a CBD guy. What do you got? Yeah, so Sun of Scaries, it's a new company based in uh, San Diego. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they specialize in CBD gummies, vitamin boost CBD gummies. 
Um, you know, t- take two kicks in in 20 minutes. It's just a good way to relax, take some of the stress away, some of the edge off, and there's no risk to buy. The company offers a 100% lifetime money back guarantee. If the product's not for you, which I don't see why it would be, but if it's not, that's okay. You'll get your money back. Sunday Scaries okay. is in the stress relieving business, not the stress causing business. And for us and I, because we believe in them, we got 25% off for you to prove it. So you vend- visit Sunday Scaries dot com and use our promo code LAFB. That's Sunday Scaries dot com. Our promo code LAFB for twenty five percent off uh, your purchase. So make sure you head to Sunday Scaries dot com today. All yeah, right, do that. Go, yeah. go out there and do that. You get twenty five percent off and free lifetime if you have any complaints, which you won't. Yeah, because exactly. Brian is the one telling you to take it. So. Yeah. Yeah, complain to me. I can't do much, but they'll they'll listen to you at least. But hey, twenty five percent off is most companies offer like ten, so that's pretty good. Um, yeah. So thanks to Bet Online, thanks to Sunday Scaries, Frost. Unless you got anything else to add, I think we'll jump into uh, this great convo with Andrew Whitworth. Let's get it. Okay, fans. Uh, this is a, a much anticipated interview with Andrew Whitworth, uh, a buddy of mine that we got drafted in the same draft class in two thousand six. Andrew Whitworth was the second pick. I was the third pick. He's been the big dog. Uh, he's been running up and down the field for, what's this, 16 years now, Whit? 16. Ooh. Yeah, and a legendary uh, feat to get to. Uh, it's the big dog, Andrew Whitworth. Welcome to the show. It's me and Ryan. What's up, dog? Hey, what's up, Ryan and Frosty? Appreciate it, man. Excited to be here. We're, yeah, we, we're excited to uh, have you. I'm, it's a pleasure for me to meet you. I tell Frost all the time, getting to get the access to talk to players and coaches. It's like a lifelong dream of mine. So thank you for uh, taking some time out of your, your busy off season so far. And, um, you know, before we get into all that, I want to go back a little bit to uh, the day you found out you're going to be a Ram coming from Cincinnati, being your whole career there. I'm sure you've been asked about it, especially when it happened, but it's been now, you know, three, four years down the line. So if you can, if you don't mind, just walk us through, walk a Rams nation through kind of what that meant going from Cincinnati, then all of a sudden being a, a Los Angeles Ram. Well, obviously there's a, there's a long history there in Cincinnati where Frosty and I had a chance to play together. And, um, you know, it's one of those things or anytime you leave somewhere you've been for 11 years, it's a, uh, it's a tough move, but yeah, I mean, uh, looking back now, uh, four, four years ago, signing in free agency here with the Los Angeles Rams, it's been, uh, you know, quite a ride. It's been an amazing, amazing ride, honestly. And, uh, some of the best years and fun years I've had playing football. I mean, the locker room, the environment here in LA has been really special. And um, you know what? It's it's hard to hang it up when when you get a chance to play somewhere you've had maybe the most fun you've had in your career. Yeah, well, I've been following you obviously since 2006. We played a great six seasons together. I think we put the core and the foundation down and getting Cincinnati to a winning uh, place. Uh, we kind of fell off, but we knew that would happen once we all left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but uh, again, you, you coming out in L.A., playing out West, playing in some big time games, getting deep into the playoffs, playing in the Super Bowl. You know, what has that feeling been like? Uh, and do you brag a little bit, you know, when you talk to people back in Cincinnati about, you know, where you've come from and where you're at today? I don't know if I, I use the word brag, Frost. <laughs> you just accidentally bring it up, right? Humble so, brag. Uh, Humble brag. Uh, it, yeah, it's uh, whoops. I forgot to mention I went to a Super Bowl and won a playoff game and, you know, all that fun stuff. You just accidentally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, you know, it's 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 been amazing. It's one of those things that um, it's we've obviously had a lot of success and I think we've averaged 10, 11 wins a season since I've been here. Um, so that's been a lot of fun when you're winning, you're having success. Uh, you're obviously going to have a lot of fun. And uh, but I think really what's made it special the most is really the environment. I mean, Sean McVay's a really tremendous young coach has created, you know, a really amazing culture and I really allowed myself and a lot of the guys, Robert Woods, other guys that came in when I did, um, you know, to really kind of be in control of the culture and and making sure that, um, you know what, as long as we do things the right way, handle our business the right way, um, he's not here to oversee us. He's here to be a part of us and, and all of us be on the same page and all of us kind of moving in the same direction. So it's made it a lot of fun to play in, in, in a relaxed environment where it's just all about, you know what, work your butt off. Uh, all of us concentrate on the best football we can play. And that's really all it is. There's no rules. There's no uh, things where you feel like you're getting hovered over all the time. It's just an environment where guys just realize, man, go out and ball and let's have a good time afterwards. And, and uh, you know what, that makes football a lot of fun. 
Absolutely. I, I, when I left and um, when I left Cincinnati after those six years, you know, getting a chance to take a deep breath and uh, go into another uh, opportunity and, you know, I had multiple opportunities after that, but just like you just alluded to uh, having the, the space to grow and feel a different way of football, you know, and, you know, we're not here to bash Cincinnati. Obviously it gave us a great start. Uh, we got to take care of our families and, and, and do that much, but there's a different way of going about your day of work when you get outside of that building. You know, there's, I'm sure in your, your, your guys' facilities, you guys got windows in your, you know, your meeting yeah. room and things <laughs> like that. You know, that stuff. You always bring that up. I love it. I didn't notice it when I was in Cincinnati. It was just like a dungeon until I left. And I was like, wow, I can see birds out there. Not that I'm, you know, gazing off into the sunset, but it was just, it, it was completely a different formula on how to go about your win, how to go about your day. And, you know, going from a cold, frigid Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, practicing outside. Now you're in L.A. Uh, you know, you're, you've been dealing with fires and whatnot. But besides that, it, it, the environment, I just know that helps to this long tenured success of you. Uh, do you have any secrets uh, that you'd like to share with us and how you can make it 16 years? Obviously, you had an injury, but you bounced back and played in the playoff game, what's your secret with? You know, I think, honestly, over my career, it's it's really been one of those things that there's certain traits that help guys play well. There's certain things you have that, uh, you know, what make you special to play in the NFL. I think every NFL athlete has some version of what it is that's unique to only them. And I think one of the things that's been really unique to me at my size and really the length I have and those kind of things is that, um, I've been somebody who hasn't had to train as much in, in the weight room as far as lifting heavy and grinding my body a lot and just maintain strength and, and just through being active, through playing lots of golf, through, through working out a lot more in just like a fitness type environment, um, keeping myself in really, really good shape. Um, I've been able to really maintain my strength. And so obviously there's those things where you got to stay healthy and you can't have injuries. But part of that is is not going out there in a state where you feel a little weaker or not going out there in a state where you feel like you're at risk. And, and for me, I haven't had to be one of those guys that's had to like push it in the weight room year in and year out to be strong. I naturally just hop off the bus when I was 18 and I'm a strong guy. And, and when I was 22, when I was 26, um, I've always had, just unique, rare, just individual strength without really having to lift. It's just natural to who I am. And so obviously that meant I put a lot of time in as a kid in high school and college and training and developing myself that way. But it's really been one of those things that throughout my career and what I've seen in veteran guys, linemen especially, yeah. you look at some of the older linemen that start to struggle, it's usually a weakness thing. They just, they, their joints don't feel good enough. They can't lift enough. And so they just don't feel that good going out there and playing. And for me, I've been able to stay really healthy because I haven't had to push my joints in the weight room and, and I've been able to just kind of stay in shape. And I think that really kind of is the, is the thing that springboards me in a position to be able to can, have that consistency and be able to go out and play well year in and year out. Absolutely, man. That's one of the things I noticed going into the league. It was like some people, you know, once they get a little bit older and stuff like that, they really rely on technique and you as a technician, that's been like your thing. You've had great, great technique so you don't have to overdo it in other areas you're very flexible I remember we have to have to do yoga classes and stuff like yeah. that you could run you know and those are some of the traits that I have I wasn't a big weight room guy and everyone used to always question it like you play d-line and you're not trying to bench 500 pounds no I'm not at all you know it's about my leverage and how I get under the pads and I can lock out that's yeah. you know if I can tear off I can play with that I had football strength and I think that's something that you have so taking it back to when we walked in um, after rookie minicamp and we were in those middle cage lockers, you know, at Paul Brown Stadium and you see Big Willie, you see Big Stacy, you see Big Bobby. What was it like going into a room like that, like a lion's den with those guys, Willie being a future Hall of Famer, Big Bobby, the boss with the big white gloves? You know, talk to me about those guys and what they meant to, you know, starting your foundation of football and the pros. Yeah, I mean, it meant a ton. I mean, you look at between Willie and, and Bobby and Levi Jones, really, you know, yeah. three vets that we had there. Uh, you're talking about some guys that uh, have played a heck of a lot of good football and, and are special players. And, and a great example of what I just said, each one of them 
has a unique set of skills that just makes them who they are. And it's all completely different. And um, I think that really being able to be in that room with those guys uh, made a significant difference in my, in my career. I mean, Willie and I still talk to this day on stuff and, you know, every now and then if I just feel a little sideways on a technique or something, I mean, I'll reach out to him and ask his thoughts because he's a guy that, you know, as special as he was physically, he was as special when it came to mentally having a plan for how to block people every single game and every single week. And that's really what turned him into a Hall of Famer is, is not just a guy who relied on the skills he had, but also the way he was able to process and play the game as well. And and then the boss man, I mean, you know, the power and, and the energy and just the positivity that guy had. I mean, it was hard not to love football and be around that guy. I mean, you might hate your job, but you loved playing football because the dude, that smile – and how much he enjoyed just hitting somebody, uh, you know, is unbelievable. And, you know, and, and nobody got more excited about when we didn't weigh in at Thanksgiving than the boss man. I mean, Bobby was pumped. He was on 10. It, hey, no weigh-ins, guys, this Thursday. Boss man was ready. But I, I was always ready to hear already. Every time. Already. Because already set the, it set the tone for lunch. It set the tone for dinner. It set the tone for Nine on seven. Every time he said already, it was time. No yeah. time, no doubt. And, you know, another guy like, uh, you know, you think of those guys, it's another guy like Justin Smith. I mean, I got a chance as a rookie uh, to get my head beat in every day by that guy because it's like regardless of whether he beat you, he was going to smack you in the face every single play. And so I thought it was a great learning tool for me. And, and really you look at our division and who I had to go against the first 11 years of my career between Terrell Suggs and James Harrison and those guys, that physical, powerful nature of rushing uh, to come in as a rookie and have to go against that guy every single day. Uh, you know, what was one of those things that really set the tone for me moving forward in my career, what it was going to take. Uh, from a from a play in and play out standpoint, uh, Jay Smith, who I, he nicknamed me Dino Bones for my arm, my skinny arm, my skinny, long, strong arms. You know, uh, he always called me Dino Bone in the big show. So uh, I'll never I'll never forget yeah. that for sure. Man, me either. Oh, man. That's great. One of the, the wildest experiences for me. And obviously later in his career, he got the nickname Cowboy. But Smitty, when I was in that room and, you know, talking to him, how he went through a game of you know, football and how physical it was for him in his offseason training, throwing kegs and stuff. Maybe that was made up. I don't know. But it sounded cool to me. Like throwing Yeah, kegs probably not. Right. OK, so, you know, I was on the receiving end of going versus Bobby and and um, and Willie and those double teams. And it was crucial. I was going to ask you about going against Justin Smith and how he set the tone. But you alluded to it. Um when you talk to Willie now today and you're talking about the future of football and how it's really turned into a, a pass running, you know, game, they're trying to get the ball down the field. It's not so much a power running game. What does he tell you about staying consistent in your in your uh, kick slides and things like that? Well, I think for Willie, it's, it, the game is so different than when he played it. I mean, it's uh, it's it's amazing. Somebody was asking me that question the other day. I mean, I can remember my rookie year uh, after Levi got hurt in week two or three and I had to start the rest of the year at left tackle. Like, we didn't get in the shotgun hardly unless it was like third and ten, right? And it's like – yeah. yeah, I mean, you hardly ever got in the shotgun. So it's it's uh, it's to think how much the game's changed in, in 15 years. Uh, it's wild. And so I think for for those guys, in some ways, for Willie, it's it's um, he's it, what's fun for him since he's training guys now and kind of doing that is he's almost relearning this kind of the game. And, and he understands a little bit of the parts of, you know, really what are going on, the intricacies of that but he can help with guys so much with the power and the physicality that, that he came up with that these guys have never seen because that's not the football game they play as much anymore. Um, so I think for a guy like him, it's really – me, it's, it's almost like I get so caught up in how fast and how quick you got to do things now – um, because, you know, really you look at it, the running game, the passing game, everything, it just moves at a different speed than it used to and when it needs to happen. And so with Willie, we kind of just have more conversations about that. And maybe it's the same technique, but it's a little quicker. It's a different step or a different hand placement. But um, it's wild how much the game's really changed when I think of a guy like Willie Anderson and how great of a player he was, but he played in a completely different league. I mean, I can think of the rushers I faced my rookie year in the NFL and it's like those guys are probably three techs or, or playing like a three, four inside now. They're not edge edge rushers anymore. Um, yeah. It's wild 
but th- that that were the those were the edge rushers at that time. You know, it's 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 amazing how much the game's changed. Yeah, the game's changing a lot. It seems like a lot of younger guys are coming out uh, early, uh, trying to get the cheese. That means they're more youthful. They can take more snaps and things like that. And they look like yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's wild. Bro. <laughs> nice. It's wild. When you uh, were talking about the game of football, you're talking about the union, you know, and being a representative, like I know you are, you're a leader. Uh, I used to see you at every uh, union meeting. Now things are going virtual and and you guys are going through a pandemic and and you guys got through it. How do you think the union, the league and the Rams did every process last year to make sure the game stayed uh, playing every Sunday? I thought it was really impressive. It's one of the times that, uh, much less our union, they did a tremendous job. But I, it's one of those things where you, you got to give credit where it's due. I, I thought the league did an amazing job of commitment to not only health and safety, but to getting the season off and 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 also just doing it the right way. And and I thought that even though at times as players we were annoyed or, or frustrated without the rules and all the different things, you have to give them credit. That they're the only sports – uh, in the world that pulled it off an entire season no uh, uh, all the way through. And, and so I think that that's, that's really impressive. And, and I think that it was a tremendous job, not only, you know, with the league and the union, but also I, I thought, you know, for us and the Rams, it was just amazing to see the, how much work, you know, and I hope you guys have a respect level for that. How, how much work went in with your medical directors, with your trainers, with, you know, the staff that had to be hired to help with all the COVID protocols. I mean, you're talking about testing, a hundred and something people every single day, keeping up with every encounter they've had, you know, all those, all the rules that had to go on during the building, all those people already had jobs that they were paid for. And then you added this pandemic and you basically just doubled their workload and they were in probably dur- doubled their work time. And, you know, it's like, how do you compensate for that? And, and so I think it's really, you know, you look across not just the Rams, but every team in the league, there's a lot of people that will never be talked about that were just as crucial uh, in pulling this season off. And, and I think it's one of those things that ought to make the NFL family pretty proud um, as far as for the players, for everyone involved, uh, being able to make this season happen was pretty special. Yeah, I yeah. agree. How, how did you, as, as a leader on the team and, you know, going into your 15th season, how were you able to maintain focus and, and keep the focus of the team up during all that? Because there was so much unknown. And, and yet you guys pulled off a, a fantastic season, making the playoffs, number one defense, the NFL, with a, a new coordinator, not the other side of the ball from you. But, but how did you just keep guys focused when uh, all that outside noise? Well, I mean, obviously, I think it's one of those things that we're, that's where your leadership and that's where communication comes in. I mean, you hear about it all the time. Guys talk about communicating, but your real teams and, and the teams that do it the right way that, that communicate and, and just, you know, what are open and honest with each other. And I think that's what we had to do throughout last year. I mean, I had, you know, probably six, seven guys training here at my house, uh, you know, in L.A. And, um, you know, we, I just turned the garage basically into a weight room and a bunch of us would train over there together. And, um, you know, and then other positions, the receivers and stuff would link up. And, and then we ended up having our own seven on seven and kind of OTA practices ourselves that we kind of put on uh, in June. You know, so it's just finding ways as, as players to take take the leadership role and say, all right, you know, what, we can figure this out. We've played enough to understand what it takes and what we need to get done. And, and so I, I think that's one of the things that really you look at going into this year. Um, you look at it right now, there's a huge deal of, of what's going to happen with, with the off season and virtual or not and all this stuff. And mm-hmm. I think it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be tough for every, for things to ever really go back to what they were before. And, um, I think it'll be interesting to see if they ever do in the off season. I think you're going to see a lot more where guys are going to have to, uh, figure it out a little bit more on their own. And, and I think guys would prefer that at this point. Yeah. Okay. I got to dive into this. The big trade. I know golf was your boy. Uh, you're there many years with them. Uh, you, you protected them. You kept them upright. What transpired during that time in your head when you're like, he's really on the, the trade block and getting Matt Stafford? How did that unfold for you? You know, obviously it's, it's tough when you, when you got a guy like Matt, who, you know, um, I knew pretty, you know, a little bit just because he, he played with Clint Bowling at Georgia and, and then obviously Clint was in Cincy. And so I, I'd known Matt over the years and kept up with him and, and you know what a tremendous player he is, but you know, with the Jared thing, it's like, uh, you knew kind of something was up just because I always said this, like when that, when the press conferences came out at the end of the season with Les Snead and, and Sean McVay and really kind of what they're 
tone was. I was like, man, you know, I don't know what the plan is at this point, but it sure seems like, you know, something's going to change. Cause just usually when you get those kind of questions and that's how you answer them, right. you know, it, it's, this is the league we live in, you know, people think, Hey, if, if, if there's a weakness or this team doesn't want this guy, like we may jump out there and, and get it, or they want to get rid of them. We'll, we'll find a way to get picks and blah, blah, blah. So that's how the league's always worked. And, and sure enough, you know, um, I think when things came out that there was, you know, like, Hey, some indecision there of what they want to do moving forward. Um, you know, you start to question and then uh, obviously you're starting to hear all the rumblings and, and uh, then obviously got a chance to talk to Jared. And, and then next thing you know, um, you know, the, the trade happens right. and you're like, man, this got sped up really fast. And, and knowing Matt and, and have heard what's going on and talking to him during that time too, I think it went way faster than he expected as well. I mean, I think it's just one of those things that there was a ton of teams that were after him. Mm-hmm. And when you start putting teams that are thinking about it against each other, um, the ones that want it the most start making moves and that thing just, it, it takes off, you know, like a wildfire. And, and that's what it did. And, uh, you know, it moved a lot faster than I think the Rams expected than, than really the Lions expected. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it may have moved fast enough to where, you know, I feel like Jared probably, you know, as, he's, as he has said, uh, you know what, kind of got caught off guard and, and didn't get as much communication through it that he wanted. But I think it's, it's one of those things that that's how the league works sometimes, man. Things, things get going fast and it's hard to slow it down. Yeah, it's hard to get your emotions in, out of it, you know, because you give so much to the game. And then when you don't get that back and the clarity and the communication throughout that, it was probably very tough on them. But, you know, as sitting back watching the game, being a fan, quote unquote, and covering the game, you know, uh, we kind of seen something happening, like you said, towards the end of the season, the press conferences, you know, uh, Coach McVay saying everyone's being evaluated and things like that. Usually he's protecting some of his guys and taking the, you know, the brunt of the the hits if there was a loss or something. But that was like the first time I, I remember me and Ryan talking about it, that he was like, yeah, everyone is going to be evaluated after this. And we're like, whoa, you know, and then uh, obviously the things happened um, with Matt coming in. No OTAs. Obviously, he's a proven veteran, a gunslinger. Are you guys doing your, as I like to call it, senior leadership and going to start up your own OTAs? Or are you guys still debating if you guys are going to do it with the team? Yeah, you know, right now the union has uh, put out a message, you know, really for guys to, to kind of approach it like last year. And, and um, you know, I, I understand the league's point of wanting to get things moving and stuff. But, you know, I, I think it's hard to not argue that, you know, thing, there's still things out there. There's still COVID positives happening. I mean, you could argue also at this time last year was more fear of what's about to happen. And this year you're still in the middle of it. So I, I think it's one of those things that, you want to make sure guys feel comfortable. Like if they don't live in LA or they don't live wherever it is they're playing, whatever team we're talking about, you know, to have to leave their families or move their families back um, to some areas where some, some of these areas, it's still a little hot and it's still things where you need to be careful. And so um, I think that really the approach that, that most of the league, it seems like uh, the players and, and with the union is, is that we really think that things should be very similar to how they were last year. And let's virtually meet. Uh, that re- went really well during the season. Re- you know, I thought it went off really well the off season as well. And then guys kind of nowadays, it's so different. You know, I mean, you know, back in the day, it was like you waited till you got with a team to get good training. But now it's like everybody has their own trainers, their own facility. Yeah. They're, they're doing it their way. And they're kind of in and they're training the way they really want to and what's really specific to them. And so I think it's harder to get guys to commit to like, oh, man, I got to come back out there. It's not that we don't have a good program or not a good weight room, but but I kind of am comfortable training the way I am. And so I think it's one of those things that you're going to see more teams probably come out. I, I saw Seattle and Denver and some of those released it just a little while ago that, um, you know, that they're not going to come to offseason program stuff. And so I think more teams will do that. And I think that's something that we'll probably entertain as well and just kind of see how it goes. But um, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think that for players in the offseason, we're one of the few leagues that really truly has like an off season per se training and like you have to come in type stuff um, rather than just a longer camp or, or whatever. So I think that it's, it's one of those things that really guys at this point can take care of themselves. They've all kind of got training plans. They all train year round. Yeah. 
Um, and, and all you need to do is really rely on your leadership to make sure the young guys understand that's how it is. Mm -hmm. And the younger players that want to get on the field understand that they got to be on top of that kind of stuff, where they're going to train, how they're going to train. And if you do that, I mean, I really think that, like I said, I think you'll see the off seasons probably change moving forward for the next few years. Well, right. and realistically, Whitworth can play 10 more years if they continue to go at this rate, because I know they take care of him during the season. I know he ain't doing much. No, nope. he's technically <laughs> sound. So no OTAs in minicamp, barely any. If you guys have a training camp, no uh, training camp. How was that last year? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, I think that you know, what the first two or three weeks we couldn't even do anything. We couldn't hit or anything. So mm -hmm. it was uh, it was special. It was a great year for me. No off season. Like I think we had like ten padded practices before our first game. Uh, it was wonderful. I, I couldn't have drawn up a better off season. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things and somebody was asking me the other day, how you've been able to play this long. And, and I think not only some of the skills I have, but some of the things that I've been able to take care of my body, but also it's been in a good time that the league has continued to kind of go the other direction in the sense of them emphasizing, taking care of players and cutting down practice rules mm -hmm. and, and all of that type stuff. So I think it's kind of matched up at a perfect time for me that like it, as it's gotten, I've gotten older, the league's gotten easier in the sense of getting through a season. Cause most people don't even understand that the reality is most guys retire in the off season or in May or in June or July because mm -hmm. of off season program, or they don't want to get through training camp. And that's it. Like they could care less about playing in a game that, that doesn't bother guys. Like you can make it through games. It's the every single day hitting each other in camp or, or the grind of like every day have to go up there in the off season for six, seven hours, you know, and just doing something where you just got done with the season, not that long ago and you're just exhausted. So I, I, it's really that time that makes it harder to get through a year. And so that's continued to get shortened. Uh, which is just, you know, I couldn't agree with more. That's for sure. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great point because I think a lot of, a lot of fans, the casual fans might hear, you know, players opting out or teams opting out. And to them, they think, oh, they just don't want to, they don't want to train. They want longer vacation. But really, like you said, the training doesn't stop. You're all doing your own training. In fact, it's probably better training because it's to your body type to exactly. Frost and I have talked a lot about different injuries and how, you know, certain guys need to train a certain way for their body type. They need to lift a certain way. So in reality, it's better for you. It keeps you healthier. It doesn't grind you out or burn you out and you come refreshed, ready to go. And, and you're not burnt out by work one. So a uh, week one. Yeah, so, no, no doubt. Stuff. Guys, guys, can, even your teams can get to the point where they're like, they help you find the trainer you need or, or the person you should be training with, you know, specific to like what you need to do to get better. And so I think that there's a lot of ways that you really look in the off season. You don't have time to wait till April to get ready for football season. Like nowadays it's the second your season ends January and February, you better be in a program, finding who it is you're going to train with, have a plan. And so a lot of guys get in that now because it's that way. A lot of guys are in their mold of like, hey, I, I've got exactly who I want to train with. I'm training the way I want to train. And I really don't want to I don't want to break from that to have to go back out to my team and have to train whatever it is they're doing, because that's really not in, you know, in the timeline of what I'm doing. I mean, what if it's a different style of lifting or a different program? You know, so I just think that you're going to see a transition. And I think COVID obviously was serious and it was an issue and it was a part of it. But I think it's also going to be kind of a stopping point mm -hmm. where guys are going to say, you know what, I had a tremendous year and I didn't go to the facility once in the offseason right. and I didn't hardly go through camp and I had a great year. And I think guys are going to finally say, you know what, like I'm going to just do what I do in the offseason and I'll see you guys come August. Yeah, and I'm sure more guys would uh, want to do that if they didn't have workout bonuses attached to their contracts. So then that yep. becomes a play in that, you know, some guys are like, well, you know, I can use the extra cheese there. Yeah. You know? and what, well, you know, what a lot of these teams did last year and what they'll, they'll do this year is they're going to start tying that to these virtual meetings. And so instead of working out, um, you can tie your attendance to logging on to the virtual meeting. And so I mean, that's, that's going to see start happening. 
And, and I think you're going to see, I think that's why the union's pushing so hard to, to make it all virtual all the time is let that be the new standard for off season bonuses and that thing, because the reality is off season bonuses were created to hide cap money. I mean, that's, that's yeah. the only reason they exist. Mm-hmm. So they don't have anything to do. I know to people they're like, Oh man, they got to pay this guy to work out. Like, no, that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. They do that so they can manipulate the cap and keep a guy under a contract. So, you know, that's just the truth. And, and so I hopefully that the union and the league will find a way to do that. Cause I really think virtual off seasons would be the way to go. And, and even if you just shorten it down to where you said, Hey, there's a two or three week window where you can come in with the team and do some OTA practices. But outside of that, you know, it's really kind of train on your own type stuff. I think you're going to start to see that being more prevalent in the league. Yeah. Last, last question on that. And then we'll move on, but just for the devil's advocate out there, because there's a lot of them, obviously. So we saw the beginning of the season, like a, I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but it seemed like from just a fan's perspective, a lot more injuries in the beginning of the season. So what would you say to kind of counter that for the people that say, well, obviously there, there is an issue with these offseason workouts because we're seeing more injuries. Did, was it just bad luck? Was it just all kind of boiled in or how, how would you kind of explain? I mean, there's no way to explain it, but what would you, I guess, say to those people? I think I'm not entirely sure of this, but I'm pretty sure that, that statistically it's actually not not the people that were injured, but the numbers were actually less um, than most years. And and really the way this works and Frost, you know, this too, it matters who gets injured. Mm-hmm. So, so when, when the reactions this way by fans, by the outsiders, as you say, it's usually because it was significant people that got injured this year. And then one year it's like, guys that people really don't know Mm -hmm. and nobody pays any attention to it. But when it's a slew of like, Oh man, you know, Nick Bosa got hurt. You know, a couple of guys got hurt. Like Chandler Jones got hurt last year. When it's a slew of guys where it's like premium names, all of a sudden people are like, Oh man, like, you know, it's because of this, like, you know, no, like Chandler Jones didn't t- tear his bicep because he didn't go through training camp. I can assure you that's not the issue. Okay. Right. Like yeah. th- that kind of injury doesn't happen because of that, you know? So it's like, th- it's just one of those things where people are always looking for what the excuse or the reason is. But the reality is, is injuries happen at the beginning of the year in training in training camp in the first couple weeks of the season, you can go just count it, go look at every season. There's a ton of injuries. And that's just because it's that first true, you know, hundred percent going and getting after it. And you're going to find out how well you've trained or how well you're prepared. And, and then also there's just freak things that happen when you start doing that kind of stuff. And I think that every year you really look at, I can always remember like that third week, third game of the preseason, you'd be like, Oh man, like who, who got through it without getting hurt? Who did not like, it was just like, you're holding on to see who had an injury and who did. Right. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but and I might be, and you can correct me. But but if I remember right, the Rams were even the team, even when there was preseason, that you guys wouldn't play starters in the preseason, right? No, we haven't played since I've got since yeah, I've been I here. Thought. Rams, uh, we haven't played in the preseason. Now we played uh, my very first year. I think we played like a drive against Oakland, maybe two drives. Um, you know, so it's been very minimal. But you know, probably not more than four drives offensively. I know since since I've been here. Yeah, that's worked out well for you guys. So. <laughs> I think that's been okay. Um, yeah, yeah. No, now we, but I'll tell you what, we were, that's somehow I think we were one of those teams. We had a good year last year. We were more prepared than maybe some teams for how things went last year because that's one of the things Sean's always done is he's always actually planned our preseason schedule around us not playing in the game. So, like, we would hold our own games, like, against each other, ones versus ones, mm-hmm. maybe the day before the preseason game. And we would really structure camp to where that's how it was built. Like all the camp days and schedule would be built around us having our practices against each other and then saving the guys who were going to have to play in the preseason game from that scrimmage and them having the opportunity to go play in the preseason game because they need to get evaluated and we got to see who can make it the roster and who can't. And so that's really, we were already built that way when we went into last season. And I think that was an advantage for us getting ready for the year. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's just wild to, to hear about how innovative, uh, an outside thinking he is to structure it that way, you know, because a lot of coaches are, it's my way or the highway. This is how we do it. I come from Parcells tree and this, you know, and all that stuff. How do you, uh, when you're being coached, let, let's put it this way, because Big Wit, you're, you know, the dean of the, the, the team. How do coaches coach you? 
Well, I think it's one of those things any player, like, uh, you know, I think I've heard, you know, different guys say this, Nick Saban, Bill Belichick, all those guys, like great players want to be coached. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's tougher when you're, when you're played as long as I have, because I think immediately coaches sometimes, or even, even people in the building will think like, oh man, I don't want to offend this guy because like, I want to make sure he thinks I respect him. And it's like, I would rather you offend me with like a coaching technique so we can talk it through or what you think should have happened. I would rather be offended by that so that we could have a conversation yeah. and like a good quality conversation where I can say, well, this is why I disagree with that philosophy or this is why I did it this way. And I think you got to make sure as a veteran player that you're encouraging your coaches and the people around you to be that way. I mean, Sean and I obviously have been very close over the years and, and uh, we've had some pretty heated uh, discussions at practice in front of, you know, makes guys uncomfortable. And, and, uh, but at the end of the day, we always hug it out and it's always like, all right, I completely see your part of you and I understand yours and here's where we're at with it now. And so I think those things are crucial to be able to have. I mean, I think it's crucial to be able to have those kind of conversations and to make sure as a veteran player, you're not missing out on some coaching that's there, but maybe they're a little uncomfortable to tell you how they feel because they're not, they're not real sure how you're going to respond. Yeah. That, that being said, have, have you had the opportunity to, to meet your new offensive line coach, Kevin Carberry? And if so, what's been your impression of him so far? Uh, just on the phone, obviously with everything going on mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, this is kind of a wild off season. Uh, yeah. We've talked on the phone and, and uh, look forward to getting a chance to visit with him and, and, and learn some of his stuff and his philosophies. Obviously, you know, he's a guy that's been around some good coaches and, and Bill Callahan and some other guys. So, um, you know, I'm sure he comes from a tree of those guys and does things similar to them. And, and so I understand a lot of those philosophies and those things. I've, I've played long enough to have heard all the different guys out there. So I, I look forward to getting to know him and, and hopefully encouraging him the same, you know, to coach me however. And uh, you know what? I'm always here to learn. Yeah. Sounds good. Wait, I got a question for you. I got two more questions for you. I'll start with this one. Uh, you're going to year 16. You've accomplished a lot in this league. You made the money. You, you're in L.A. You're in Hollywood. So you're a household name now. You're not hidden in Cincinnati. What do you tell a young Andrew Whitworth coming out in the draft now? What do you tell him today? You know, I think the, the biggest thing to me that you look at these young linemen is, uh, you know what, don't be afraid to be themselves and, and be who you are and, and find the traits and the skills and the things that uh, you know you can do well through watching guys play and just pick up little things from each guy. No, don't think like I have got to, I've got to go be Tyron Smith or I've got to go be Jason Peters. Or, I've got to go be Trent Williams. Like the reality is you'll never be those guys, but you can be your version of that. And, and so go find the skills or the techniques or the things that you do well with them. Maybe listen to, to guys who, when they tell you, Hey, you, you move similar to this guy, or you have strengths like this guy, you know, and, and then go study them and see if there's something you can pick up from them. And I think one of the, the things that really helped me the most is that I came in the league with really two guys that were polar opposites and Levi Jones and Willie Anderson. And, and so I got a chance to learn from a guy like Levi who could move and do things in a way that I would never be able to do. But if I just picked up a little inch of it or just a little, just like one little part of his game and, and quickness and understanding how to make a guy do something I want or reaction that I want to get out of the guy. And then also used a guy like Willie, who I was built more like with length and, and power and all those type things. Um, it, it gave me a chance to really have two parts of me that I could kind of pull off of two great football players. And so that's really what helped me. And then I would take that and go study all the guys around me that were successful. And I think to me, it's don't be afraid to be yourself um, you know, obviously you got to work hard, but two, don't have so much ego that you can't go pull from guys who play the game. Like you don't, it being the best doesn't mean that all the other guys aren't really good. And it doesn't mean that there's a lot of guys out there that you can't learn from. It means that, you know what, to be the best, I'll take all these guys and what they do and appreciate them for who they are. But I'll also pull from things that I see they do really well that I'll go, you know what? That could be part of my game. I could use that. And I think if you can do that well, you'll have a chance to be really successful. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, I'll, I got a few more too. Uh, and then we'll let you go. Really, really do appreciate the time, Andrew. It's been awesome. Uh, great stuff as always. But uh, first, let me uh, talk about your unit real quick, the offensive line that, you know, from 2019 to 2020, we saw a huge improvement overall. You've obviously been a staple. So, I mean, you're we know what we get out of you and it's, it's consistent, which is amazing um, to see. So how 
refreshing, I guess, was it to see just your unit improve that much and how important is consistency on the offensive line to keep that steady improvement going forward? Well, I think it's one of the greatest things an offensive lineman can have is the trade of consistency. I mean, if they can be consistent game in and game out and a coach can know exactly what they're going to get out of the guy. I mean, I think there's great examples of those kind of guys across the league, you know, that it's like, all right, this guy might not be the most dominating player ever, but I, you know what, he does these things well and, and he's very consistent at, at them. And, and so their team plays with a certain style and, and they're able to win because they they play to that consistency. And I think as an offensive lineman, being consistent is extremely important. And I think you really look at 19, and I said this a bunch of times, even though people didn't want to hear it, is that the truth was, I mean, the majority of the guys we were playing in games with had never stepped on an NFL football field. And it's like, you know, people all of a sudden want them because they're playing in a good system or they're playing for a good coach or whatever it is to just play out of their minds. And that's just not how NFL football works. Like to me, it's almost disrespectful to the game for you to like think that that's not a part of why there, there there's a little bit of a let off. Like you can't just expect some dude's going to walk off the street and say, all right, I'm going to throw some pads on and I'm going to go out and dominate as an offensive lineman like that or a D line. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. you're going to have your bumps along the road. And so 19 was that season and those guys grew up and, and you know what, they were wired the right way. They responded, they worked their butts off. Um, we, we got a lot of garage workouts in, in 2020 and uh, you know what, they, they had a heck of a year. We got a lot of guys, honestly, it's one of those things where we had so many guys play in 19 there right now, you know, you look at their, that the roster and you've really almost got six, seven guys that have started games for us or at some point we've had to rely on them to start in a different position in the offensive line over the last two years. I mean, that kind of experience is a huge factor in helping you feel confident about your football team because when you've got ability to replace guys at, line, at, at the offensive line position and you also are starting to get guys that are experienced at the offensive line position, um, when that part of the game, if it's your D-line or it's your O-line, is consistent and you can rely on them to kind of show up every week, Go look at how many teams win that just have one of those two things, and if they have both, they win a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very valuable to have depth. Um, this is my one B to that question, just because you just brought this up, uh, Big Wit. When you have depth like that and then people get injured, would we ever see Big Andrew Whitworth go play guard or center if need be? Uh, you know what, I, over the last years to, uh, you know, I, I thought it might be an option. I, you know, when we lost Roger Saffold, um, there was opportunity out there where, you know, Trent, Trent Williams was still getting in the middle of trades and all that type stuff. And I can remember like at one point being like, man, Hey, listen, go trade for the guy. I'll move to left guard. I don't care. Like we would, we would monster mash people. Uh, so, you know, anyways, you know, so I was like, it was one of those things, like I was always open to that throughout my career. Cause I always kept it in my, in the back of my head, like, all right, you know, early in my career, I did that. Right. And I, I'm, and I'm built with the strength to be able to play in there. You know, a lot of tackles sometimes are, are, are twitchy and have those things, but they're not necessarily, they can't move inside necessarily to play. You know, for me, that fits my game a little better than, than probably some tackles and edge guys. But I, I've always kept that in my head, you know, and, and it's one of those things that uh, I prepare myself mentally if that happens. And, and it could happen. I mean, you never know. I mean, right now, that's the, that's the unique thing with the depth we have. You know, you really look at it, you know, between our guys with with Joseph Noteboom, Bobby Evans, yeah. Dave Edwards. I mean, Corbett, Havenstein, all those guys like. Brian Allen, who played for us and then got injured and now is back healthy. I mean, you really look at it. We've got an opportunity to create some competitions at some positions. And, I mean, who knows what happens? I mean, what if what if Joe Noteboom is, is you know, in the next six months, all of a sudden the, the best player we have and he's a left tackle only? I mean, you know, what? where can you go beat out somebody and play, you know, beside him? It's one of those things that, to me, I think that's another part of it. Mentally, I've always entered every season like I've got to earn my spot and I've got to earn earn my position. Uh, I know people think that's like, yeah, right, you're just saying that, but that's the truth. Like in my mind, um, every single year you earn the respect you get. And um, so I've got to go earn the position again. And if I don't, I want to earn another one. So, you know, I think it's one of those things that uh, it's, it, that, that depth helps. We're going to be able to create some competition up front and really get to get out there, hopefully, if, if guys stay healthy with, with our best five, which is going to be an experienced group, you know, finally, in year three of this group being together. And so I think we're excited about that. 
I love that mentality. My last question. I don't know what Ryan, Ryan says that a lot. And he always has like five more, but um, no, my no. last question for big lit. It's April. What is the team goal today for Andrew Whitworth? As you are the Dean of the, the team, you're the, the eldest, you're the, the leader uh, at every facet of the, the team. What is the team goal? I think right now, uh, you know, Anthony Munoz shared this with me uh, a long, long time ago. And, he, you know, he, he was a guy that I obviously leaned on, the greatest left tackle to play the game, and, and the one uh, Hall of Famer in Cincinnati, uh, which, Lord, I hope they start paying him a lot more love. But, uh, you know what, it, he was one of those guys that always told me, he said, listen, Whit, he's like, the off season has got to be your time to be selfish. And, and you've got to selfishly work in the offseason. And I think for me right now, I would say I hope that selfishly uh, every single guy is approaching their, their work and the way they're training and the way they're menta- mentally just building themselves up for, for training camp mm-hmm. with the mentality that they're going to be the best and they're going to be the, they're going to be the reason we win. And if, if you can put a collection of, of 53 guys that, that approach their offseason with the mentality of, I'm going to be the reason we win, um, you're going to have an opportunity to win a lot of football games. And, and I think that that's the way you got to do things. It's every single day, whether it's taking care of their body, whether it's training, whether it's mentally growing, whatever it is that they need to be better at. And that's another thing I tell young guys that I have to say is that, you know what, the difference in the NFL is not, hey, you know what? these guys just had this much level, higher level skill than you. It's that your really special football players have this high skill thing and the things they're bad at, they continually just bring up. And, and it's like, oh man, like, man, this used to be weak, a weakness of theirs. And now it's not. And this guy just destroys people, you know, and, and, and too many young guys have a talent level and they only work on their talent and they never work on the things that they're not good at. Mm-hmm. And they waste their own time doing that. And it's like, dude, if you just got rid of the things you're bad at, you're here because of this thing. It's ego. You're, you're, you're not where you want to be because of the other things. You know what I mean? And so it's like, you got to, you got to, you got to help selfishly say, you know what? I got to drop my ego to want to be good and say, what is it that I need to be better at if I want to be the reason we win next year? And that would be my goal. That guys can take that approach to selfishly say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to attack the things that I need to be better at for me to be a reason we win. And if we can do that, we'll have a chance to have success. I love it. Yes, sir. Man, that's awesome to hear. Uh, Refreshing to hear. Um, Okay. So I have two more and they're quick though. I promise. So first, and it's piggybacking off what you're just saying, Wit, uh, in your training and your relentless to get better and uh, obviously to rehab the injury. We saw the video of you pushing uh, the pickup truck. What uh, what inspired that? And obviously, I think the knee's looking pretty good then. Yeah, I mean, uh, every now and then, off-season training, we'll, we'll get out there and do that instead of, uh, you know, since you're working out in the garage and in the neighborhood, um, I can't really haul off in the middle of the, the uh, club and, and start pulling sleds down the streets. So uh, every now and then just outside the house, we got a good little slope that kind of sits outside the driveway and on the street to our house. And so we just, uh, you know what, we, we put the truck in neutral and, and let a guy sit in there and get a, get a couple pushes. And, and you know, um, it, it, it's good, man. It, it creates a little bit of that mentality of it's, it's not necessarily something that similar to what you're doing, but it's uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of add it to leg day to get a little burn. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and also it looks great on Instagram. So, oh, you yeah. know, that's always the most important thing. So it looks great. good on the Insta and uh, you know what? It's a good training technique as well. I love it. I want to make a shirt out of it. Frost and I are like, we didn't make a t-shirt out of that. That, that could do well in LA. Uh, like- yeah. So, all right. Last one for me. And uh, so this, in my opinion, I think is the most uh, prestigious award, the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. I have to ask you about it since you were the Rams nominee for it. Um, you know, hats off to you. I think it's an amazing achievement. So first of all, what uh, what did that mean to you to get that uh, award? And then also just talk to everyone kind of about what why you got it, what you do in the community and, and what you're involved in and, and charities of why you're so important to our LA community, which makes you so great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things. It's my third time in a year, yeah, third time in a row, excuse me, uh, getting nominated for this by the Rams. And uh, I keep fighting uh, them from nominating me because I hate it. But it's it's one of those things that uh, it's a, it's an amazing honor. And it's you look across the league and the 32 representatives and the guys, what they've done for their communities, for where they've come from. 
um, it's really special. And, and, and that's really what usually makes me realize what an honor it is, is I'll go read the list and kind of what those guys are up to. And wow, it's humbling to see some of the things that guys are making an impact with. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a really special thing to get to be a part of people's lives. I mean, obviously you selfishly want success in your own life. You want to be good at what you do, but you know what? I think there's no greater joy than creating opportunity and being there for somebody help pr provide support uh, or bringing a smile to somebody else. I mean, those to me are some of the greatest joys in the world. Um, so, you know, if I got this position in life, like to, to be an opportunity to be an NFL football player and uh, if it, our life was only about getting there and then just, you know, sitting there and enjoying the, the things that come with it um, you know what, to me, that'd be pretty boring. So, uh, you know what, taking the opportunities I've had and trying to make a difference for the communities around me, for the kids that are growing up in schools, looking up to you for kids that don't even know who you are, but they didn't get a fair shake. Um, you know what, I think it's one of those things to me, it's the most rewarding part of this job. And it's, it's honestly one of the passions, uh, that keeps me playing. I mean, I've, I've put in my last couple of contracts. I've literally negotiated based off of, Hey, I want to make this, contribution or I want to do this financially for schools in LA. So we need to get to this number. Or we need to do that. Like it's, it's something to me that is a part of my everyday life and, and extremely important to me. Um, I heard uh, Jalen Rose say this actually, you know, earlier, it's like when you're an athlete, you're automatically put in a position where you're supposed to be a mentor and people are supposed to look up to you, you know, not necessarily the case when you're an actor or you're a musician or any of that, for whatever reason, our athletes, we just immediately are like, all right, the kids look up to them. You got to be like them. And, and so I think that it's one of those things that, yeah, you might not want to be it and you might not want kids to, to want to be like you, but they're going to watch and they're going to want to be like you and their parents are going to push them to. And uh, you're going to have to be conscious of that. And so to me, it's, it's one of those things. It's a combination of wanting to make sure I represent that well, but also I want to make sure that people in life know that uh, I don't care where you're from, uh, what color your skin is, what your background is, doesn't matter to me. Um, I want you to achieve your goals and I want you to have an opportunity to be successful and be proud of who you are. And, and so whether it's a kid, whether it's an adult, making sure I get out there and tell people I'm proud of them and tell them that I'm here to help them. Uh, to me, that's one of the greatest parts of life and one of the greatest, you know, things that the NFL makes it special, getting an opportunity to do. Well, with everything that you stand for, everything that you're saying, brother, is right up the same uh, fabric as myself. Uh, you know, we might want to get you down south to Orange County and come help out at the Stay Ready program. And um, I'd love to. We're mentoring kids, we're training them, and we're doing the same thing, encouraging them to take that extra step to, you know, stay in school, listen to the coaches, the parents, un uncles, aunties, uh, stay focused and determined to, to achieve something. So why don't you come on down and bless us, man? Let's do it, man. I'm in. <laughs> Sounds good. Love it. So, well, like I said, this is a huge honor for me with, so thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy and, you know, spending time with family and everything. So thank them also for us, for, uh, for letting you skip away for a little bit, but, um, you know, keep, uh, grinding where we hope the best for you for the rest of the off season and, and can't wait to stay in touch and watch you have another dominant, uh, season in the NFL. Well, Ryan and Frosty, I appreciate it so much. It's good catching up and, uh, having this chance to visit and, uh, look forward to it. Let's go. What a guy, man. You know, there's no no wonder he's gotten the Walter Payton Award three times in a row. Uh, obviously, he leads by example. He works very hard. Um, there's just no question why the city of L.A. has embraced him the way they have. Yeah. Yeah, I love hearing that. All, all that he said, I think, is what represents how me and you feel about things. And it's good to see him using his platform, his ability to to do better. And, um, you know, it's not it's not every day that a – offensive lineman is one of the faces of a franchise uh you know there's it's changing a little bit now in today's nfl but you always have the premier pass rusher you have the quarterback you have the running back the receiver and i think for the rams obviously aaron donald probably is the face jalen rams would probably be like 1b and then we'll see with matthew stafford coming but on the offense right now i think it's whitworth and robert woods are kind of the two faces so i think that's that speaks to him how important he is to the team how important he is to the community and then just how good of an NFL player he is. So uh, awesome to be able to, to get him on here and, and hopefully uh, Rams fans, not hopefully, I know they did enjoy that. Yeah, absolutely. LA, you should be very proud to have one of your sons being Andrew Whitworth. That's playing hard and dedicating his, um, 
his self, his resources to the community and playing excellent football for you. Um, yeah. so good luck to the Rams. Good luck to Andrew Whitworth. Yep. And as we see all the time, he's coaching up the players around him. So even when he was injured, injured as devastating as it was, you know, Nopum was able to step in. I thought played very well in his stead. He's not Andrew Whitworth, but he played well. And a lot of that's to the tutelage and coaching a wit, which I'm sure we'll see through the rest of his career. And, and maybe he'll go into, into coaching afterwards. I was going to ask him that, but we, it was just going so good. And we had, we had him longer than I expected. So I didn't even want need to get to that. No, that's good, man. He's a great man. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for us for the, the connection there. Obviously you guys go uh, way back um, before we sign off. How, when you guys battled in a, in training camp or practice, who won most of the one-on-ones or did you guys ever go against each other? We went at it. Well, we went at it. Like I said, we were drafted in 06. Uh, Jonathan Joseph was our first pick. Andrew Whitworth was second. I was the third pick and Domita Pekka was the fourth. Uh, Great draft class. Knowing, you know, tenured football careers and me and him went at it. He was a tackle. You know, I was a defensive end, especially for those first seven years of my career. So it really got good when I went to Cleveland and had to play versus him twice, <laughs> you know. So, no, we really went at it. You know, it was all love after the game, but, you know, we went at it. We, you know, we almost got a penalty when I, when I was in Cleveland and we came to Cincinnati. It was my first game uh, playing in Cincinnati, coming back. And uh, me and Andrew Whitworth went at it. and It was a great game. And um, they actually stole that game and got a win out of it. And they came up to Cleveland and we got him there. But uh, it's always been a, a great matchup between us because it's all respect. He knows how I grind. I knew how he grinded. And, and look at him go now. I'm going I'm to pull up the game pass and, and pull that, that game tape up and watch it. Do your thing. It, it, <laughs> hey, get your popcorn ready. Yes, sir. Can't wait. So, uh, well, that was a blast. Thank you all for tuning in uh, to the LA Football Podcast. Frost, what's uh, tell everyone where everyone can find you and chat with you and, and get to know you? Yeah, you can find me at the Organic Frost. That's on social media, on Twitter uh, and Instagram. Uh, you can also follow me at StayReadyFootball.com since we're doing great things in the, the communities in Southern California, uh, doing coaching clinics and co- uh, athlete clinics and mm-hmm. mentoring and doing our thing. So that's if you got a question for us there, it's info at StayReadyFootball.com. There you go. Yeah. Stay ready football. It's starting to starting to really take off now that things are restrictions are loosening and, you know, we're allowed to be out in, in public and hanging out. So I think uh, I love what you guys are doing there and we're, we're going to be involved as well. And um, I think it's just, yeah, an awesome, awesome thing that you're doing. So um, stay ready football.com. Make sure to check that out, especially if you have kids and you're listening and you want to learn from one of the best ever to do it. That's where you go. Um, you can find me at Ryan Dyer at LAFB, the main show at LAFB network on all platforms at LAFB network on YouTube. Make sure to, Hit that subscribe button if you're watching there. Uh, Appreciate you. Helps us out. And uh, we are everywhere you listen to podcasts. So everyone have a great uh, week. Thanks for tuning in. Frost, thanks as always, my man. Always in LA. I'll check in with you later.